And we are live. I'm kicking it off just a few minutes early. Uh, last few times I went live, it seems to happen. I'm going live, everything's going fine, and about a minute or two in, it cuts out, and then it comes back a minute later. So if you're watching this on the replay and all of a sudden it's going to go black, hang in there or advance it like one minute forward, and we'll be back. I don't know, I don't know why it's going now. I'm not losing the signal. Don't know what the issue is. Uh, the only thing that uh, uh, StreamYard tells me is plug directly in. That should not be an issue. Because I can upload fine, download fine. Everything's fine. I do not know why it does it. So uh, too slow. Thanks for tuning in. And Uncle Nate drinks whiskey. Thanks for tuning in. So happy Father's Day to everybody's Father's Day. I know it seems strange that I'm going live on a Sunday. Normally, I, I was going live on a Fridays, and then I switched to Saturdays. I'm going live uh, today on Sunday because yesterday I was out house hunting. Uh, let me pour myself something real quick. Um, yesterday I was house hunting. So long story short, uh, uh, a colleague of mine had contacted me a little while back about a position, and they were looking for somebody, so I contacted them. I uh, did an interview, and they made an offer I can't refuse. Uh, so I'm starting a new job, but it means I'm moving again. Uh, so yesterday, I was looking at houses. And uh, so I know I'm sort of got, hey, Grumpy Old Fart, how you doing, man? So we're going to talk about Glen Morgie Distillery. And I just posted a re review of the Malaga Cast. It was actually fantastic whiskey. But I'm really not in the mood to drink Glen Morgie tonight or late evening or early evening. <coughs> Um, so Friday, uh, there's a viewer and it goes by Dram Yankee, Dram Yankee. So he was going to be in town. He and a couple of his brothers, they want to go wine tasting. They, you know, so I went to tag along. So we went over, we we're over in the Napa Valley, visited some wineries, had a really good time. Um, it was very, very bumper to bumper, a typical touristy time this time of year in the Napa Valley. And he gave me some sample bottles. So I thought rather than. Drinking more of the Malaga cask. I'm going to drink something a, a little different. And uh, I'll show you what this is. Uh, give me a whole bunch of bottles. This is the Lefroig uh, Karchis PX cask, cask strength, triple matured, finished in Pedro Jimenez, bottled at 58.9% alcohol by volume. Uh, I looked at I looked at the price. Prices were average 110 to 135 dollars. So that's what I'm gonna pour myself a little. <coughs> um, so I, I'm having a hell of a time with allergies. You know, I should have loosened the cap. I should have loosened the cap. Anyway, there we go. Okay, we're yeah, we're good. Uh, had a heck of a time with allergies. You anyway, know, so so yesterday I was out, out house hunting, and I was looking at houses in Half Moon Bay. If you don't know where that is, it's probably so along the coast, off of Highway 1, I don't know, half an hour south of San Francisco, half an hour, 45 minutes, something like that, uh, south of uh, San Francisco. Um, how about Balcona's single barrel malt? Uh, not at the moment. No, I'm going to uh, – so, so what the heck? Rather than drink this, I'll, I'll accept it. Anyway, so we want wine tasting, you know, fat, fantastic Cabernets. You know, Napa is known for its Cabernets. Uh, of course, there's some Merlot. We went to uh, tasting with Myriad, and then we went over to Frank Family Vineyards. They went on to Venge uh, Vineyards afterwards. I was tired at that point. I went home and took a nap. So uh, anyway, so that's what I'm drinking right now, the Lafroy Karchis Peter Jimenez cask. Uh, thanks to, thanks to um, Dram Yankee. Nice. All righty. So I've had a heck of a time with allergies, um, taking all kinds of allergy meds and, and all that. When I went house hunting yesterday and went down to the coast, really cleared up. You know, it gets fresh air, a lot cooler, ocean breeze, you know, I don't have all the pollen. And as I was looking at, I looked at some houses, and as I was driving home, just as I, I come up on uh, 101, and then get on to 12, which then takes me up into the hills, into the Sonoma wine country. And I could feel the pollen attacking me. As soon as I start head up there, my eyes start itching and the whole nine yards. So in addition to getting a new job and, move, being, uh, and moving uh, close to the beach, I'm hoping 
it'll help me out with these allergy issues. Anyway, so I took a little, did a little video shot. Uh, I looked at a couple different houses, and there's one particular house that if you go out the front door, walk down a little bit, hang a right at the stop sign, then walk, go across the street, boom, you're right there at the beach. So I'll show you a little. So this is this is you know five minute walk at most uh, from where I will be living. Uh, let me sh just show you the the video here. Anyway, so excited about that. I'm not a real beach person. I don't surf. I'm not into boating or fishing or whatever else, but it'd be nice. And it's nice to look at, you know, it will be cool air, free air conditioning. Um, so it'll be nice. Eric Anderson, hi, thanks for tuning in, man. So it'll be nice. And there's a colleague of mine who lives in the area. So I'm looking forward to that. But from Half, uh, Half Moon Bay, um, if you go up uh, at least 90, 29 or 92, it's 92. You go up over the hills, and you, when you go up over the top of the hills, that takes you down into the into the valley, the um, southern part of uh, San Francisco Bay. But if you go up to the top of the hills um, and if you come, come from Half Moon Bay, hang a right, it's called Skyline. And up there, that takes you out into the woods. So there's various redwoods, forests. There's, there's actually some wineries uh, down there. And if you're into motorcycle riding, it's a beautiful place, you know, to you know be riding your motorcycle and all that. So I'm looking forward to uh, the once I get moved and settled in to be able to go back and explore now. I've already, I've done a lot of hiking up there. So I'm looking forward to be able to go back there again. Whew. So in case you're turning in late, I am doing the, a sample of the Lafroy cart. This is what I'm, I'm on now, but I'm going to be talking about Glen Morangy distillery. And I'm drinking this because it was a gift from Dram Yankee. And I don't feel like drinking Glen Morangy. But I got to study it. We got to study it. So uh, we'll get into it. Super, super dark. There's, the, I, I, this, if, you're, if you've had Pedro Jimenez cast whiskeys, classic, that sort of dark prune, very dark dried black fruit notes, but then intermixed with the smoke. It reminds me of Glenmore. So I have a Glenmore repeated in PX. And it's a lot like that. There's some spice on the back end, some black licorice. Baking spices. I say baking spices a lot. Hey, Dan, how you doing, man? Hey, Mark, thanks for tuning in. Wow. Now, this is castor. I'm going to taste it a little bit neat, and I'll probably put a drop of water into it. Wow, that is super deep, super dark, super rich, dark chocolate. The peat and smoke, I mean, it's there, but at the Pedro Jimenez, it's like it's grabbed onto it, and the other two are really tightly. Hey, Jack White, how you doing, man? Um, it says, uh, congrats on the new house. Thank you very much. So I looked at the houses, and then I just got notified today uh, that I got the house. I looked at a couple different houses and I was one I was like, nah. and so there's one I really wouldn't want. The one challenge with this house is it's multi-level. Uh, so it's like this. And so there's like three different levels and up and down stairs and that kind of stuff. So I kind of don't like that. I, I'd rather have laid out, but you know, anyway, but it's three bedroom. Uh, it's got plenty of living space, a two car garage. Um, uh, there's like a living room downstairs with a fireplace, and then there's like a dining. Next level is like a dining room area, formal dining room area. And the next level is uh, bedrooms, three bedrooms, and then like the the kitchen and all that. So, but once I get moved in and settled in, it, it's not going to look that much different than this because I'll set everything up the same way, right? So more or less, it's going to probably look the same once I get uh, moved in. You won't know this uh, that much of a difference in terms of the videos. Uh, gonna have a bigger whiskey room uh, or rooms. Uh, I haven't decided if I'm gonna. I might. I might use one of the bedrooms as a whiskey room, or I might 
to where see the, the thing is it's almost like three dining areas there's like a, a formal dining area and then you go out and there's a kitchen and there's like a kitchen nook dining area i might use the kitchen nook dining area um for where all my whiskey stuff is going to be i haven't decided yet i'll have to figure that out um but then of course the master bedroom um the window to the master bedroom looks out over the ocean you can't because there's trees and stuff in the way so you don't get like a total you know, picturesque view, but you can't see the ocean from the window from the master bedroom. But there's some eucalyptus trees in the way. Mm. Prunes, raisins, dark, 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 dark chocolate. That's been smoked. It's almost like chocolate without the marshmallows. There's no mar almost like s'mores without the marshmallows. It's like it's and you and you burnt your or, or you burnt your marshmallow. You know how like you, you're you're trying to toast your marshmallow, and all of a sudden, poof, it catches on fire. That's what it's like. <laughs> and then you took your your burnt marshmallow, and then you stuck it on the chocolate. <laughs> and that that's that that that's what it's like. That's what it was like already. So um, so this book is not for the level two. This is actually for the level three. They call them the, the uh, Master of Scots level. And there's like. I don't know, 10 or so books you got to read. This is one of them. This is Charlie McLean. This is The Spirit of Place. Like Dave Broom's book, it's a coffee table book, uh, you know, because it's large and a lot of pic big pictures and stuff like that. But I think I like Charlie McLean's book better. Um, I think it's better written. No offense to Dave Broom. I think it gives more detail um, than Dave Broom does. So if, if you know between Dave Broom's Atlas of Whiskey, World Atlas of Whiskey, and Charlie McLean, I would go Charlie McLean. All right, you know, so it's Father's Day, and so I, where I live, it's a fifty-five plus community, so a lot of elderly people. So my neighbors, I can hear them. Um, they're probably in their seventies, and but their grandkids are over there, and it smells like they're having a barbecue. I can smell grilling hamburgers right now with my neighbors. All right, so uh, Judith, hi, thanks for tuning in. Good evening, Eric. I am jealous. The view from your house is is fantastic. Uh, yeah, it'll be really, really something. It'll be really, really something. Uh, I just I have another video. I just shot. Uh, I'll post it in Facebook later on. Uh, right now, just out back. So there's in this house. There's a golf course out and back. And actually, you know what? I wouldn't be able to do it right now. Um, there were deer out in the backyard. I don't know if you can be able to see this. There were deer out in the backyard and golfers at the same time. Deer usually come either early morning or late afternoon, so you don't see them. Here, I'll, I'll see if I can show you this video. I'm, I'll post this later in Facebook. Um, anyway. Go. Go. Come on. There we go. Come on. There we go. Sorry. Thing's not cooperating. And what happened to the damn volume? Golfers. In oh, hold on. Attack. Sorry. One more time. Back it up. All right, here we go. One more time. Sorry. I'm gonna miss this place. Deer and golfers in their natural habitat. <laughs> and anyway, I just shot this like 10 minutes ago, just before going live. Uh, I shot this out. There were deer in the backyard and a little baby doe, you know, and the golfers out there. So, anyway, it's kind of funny. As I am going to miss this place, you know. Um, I remember when I got the, 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 the job I'm just leaving or having left. Um, and I moved here. It was a dream to live in the wine country. I never ever, I, I mean, I've always dreamt of living in the wine country. Um, and I've lived here for a year now and it's been absolutely fantastic. And the other morning I was in the kitchen looking out over the mountains and the sun was just coming up. The coffee was brewing and just bright blue sky. And then the clouds are coming through because of the morning sun and when it goes through the clouds, it was you know, like pink clouds. It was just absolutely beautiful. 
And I kind of got teary-eyed a little bit because I'm going to miss this place. I, I, I love this place. Uh, I love living here. It's been a dream to, li to live here. But one of the things that went through my mind was um, life is short. Life is a gift. These moments in time are a gift. And you can't hold on to them like this. You hold on to them with an open hand. And they come and they go. It's kind of like a really good bottle of whiskey. You know, there's some there's some whiskeys, you know, you can get another bottle and get another bottle, another bottle, and another bottle. But there are these special bottles of whiskey, say like from um, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. You know, once that's gone, it's gone. That's it. They're gone. Uh, or like the Ardbeg uh, Dark Cove, right? The best whiskey I think Ardbeg ever released. And you go, oh, you know, of course they jump up in price, right? I have two of them. Uh, I got them for 150 Now they're going for like 1000 but you kind of, oh, that whiskey was so good. Oh, I wish I could have bought. Oh, I wish I would have bought another one. Oh, and you kind of do that, you know. But, you know, there's thousands of bottles. There's always, there'll be more bottles to come. There's hundreds of distilleries. You know, there's just a gazillion bottles out there. And instead of living with a regret of it being gone, instead live with the memory of that was such a great bottle. Um, and it was part of the journey. Uh, and now you move on to another bottle. And it's similar, I, I'm taking the same approach to this house, as much as I'll miss it, it's been like a vacation house to live in. Um, but I'm moving on to another house and I'm gonna ha have a beach life experience. I've had the wine country life experience. Now I'm gonna have the beach life experience. I'm gonna go from one to the next. Now it's a hassle to move and all that kind of stuff. But I really just said, so you know what? Just be thankful for the time that you've got. Be thankful for that bottle that you had that was really good. Be thankful for that friendship with somebody. Maybe they're gone um, or a relative. Maybe My father died in 2009, um, so I miss him. So a day like today, you know, I can't help but think of my father uh, and miss him. Um, so he died when he was 79. I know someone whose uh, their father died when he was 12. I've known people who didn't grow up, who grew up without a father. Now, my father was far, far from perfect, but I'm glad he was there. Um, and so you just kind of, you know, life is a vape, but a vapor. Um, it comes and it goes. And so you be thankful for the time that you had, uh, perhaps with your father, or if, you're, if your father's still alive and you're able to spend time with him now, treasure those moments because eventually one day he'll be gone if you don't go first. Anyway, same thing with whiskeys. And these experiences, same things with places we live, uh, the dream of living on the wine country, or now moving on to living uh, I, I, on the beach. Uh, Isla Junkie says, uh, first time here, I'm a patron with uh, Trinity and C. Oh, cool. And that's where I met you sort of speaking for the first time. I'd heard the name, but, but that is it. Trinity and C, man, it's, those guys are great up in Canada. Two of the funny, funniest guys, real life, down to earth, um, the real deal guys long time whiskey tubers uh those guys crack me up um you know if there's certain channels that if i'm in the mood if i need to be if i need to laugh they're one of the channels uh, scott test dummies you know the vault um <coughs> they're just naturally funny and they have their own unique sense of humor so i like i like to watch those guys all right another little sip we'll get into this and then we'll have a, a quiz Tony McLean, Spirit of Place, Glenn Morangy, light, floral, and citric. For many years, Glenn Morangy has been the best-selling malt whiskey in Scotland. So it is perhaps surprising that until the late 1970s, the vast majority of the make went for blending. I didn't know that. It was only in 1979 that the company began to promote it as a single malt. The distillery stands on the southern shore of the Dornoch Firth. So, uh, have I got a map? Yes, I do. So, where is the Dornoch Firth? See the S on the word Highlands? See the S there? Right where the S is, that is, where, that is the Dornoch Firth, and that is the area of Tain. Uh, and that is where um, Glen Morangy's at. So right above the S, where it says Highlands, that is where they're at. 
So in real close to there is, is Bal Blair, and then you go over a little waterway, and there's a town of Dornock, and there's actually a Dornock Castle Hotel. I stayed there um, my second trip. No, my first trip to Scotland. Anyway, so that's where that's at. Near, anyway, um, so the distillery stands on the southern shore of the Dornock Firth near the Royal Burg of Tain in Rosshire. Tain is Scotland's oldest royal borough with a bishopric dating from the 9th century. The distillery was created in 1843 by Wayne Matheson, part owner of Bow Blair Distillery. So when I visited Glenmorangie, I then also visited uh, Bow Blair. And a relation of Alexander Matheson, who founded Dalmore Distillery. One of the interesting things about, and it's the same way in the wine, in the wine world, a lot of history, families and so forth, are very much intermingled in all the distilleries. Uh, and you could almost, it almost, it'd be an interesting project to put all the various distilleries and then draw lines in between them as to their relations, Grant Smiths and so forth. And then, of course, they change ownerships and all that. So a lot of the, a lot of the distilleries, the histories are, are uh, combined or interlap or interweave with each other. Matheson built the distillery on the site of a brewery. There's several distilleries that start off as a brewery, which had been operating since 1738. Glen Morey, for example, started off as a brewery. Uh, within six years of opening, production had reached 90,000 liters or 20,000 gallons of pure alcohol, which was a sizable amount for the time. The distillery made good use of the barley grown locally on the fertile lands of Easter Ross. Back to the section here. So sometimes, by the way, sometimes I do this reading a book uh, for, on Facebook. I, try, I do these sort of uh, impromptu readings about um, a distillery as I'm drinking a dram. Uh, Fernando, hey, th thanks for uh, tuning in, man. How you doing? Um, William Matheson completed the rebuilding a year after Bernard's visit. And in 1918, the distillery was bought by a partnership of Leith, blending from McDonald and Muir and whiskey brokers, Durham and Company. There are very, very, very few distilleries that are over 100 years old that remain in the same hands. Glenn Farkless is one. Vast majority of distilleries. The histories are quite complicated, um, constantly changing ownership, ownership, and the vast majority of them at some point in time shut down due to prohibition or first and second world war and so forth. So they all have very similar ups and downs that way. By the late 1930s, whole ownership lay with McDonald and Muir and remained so until 1996 when the company became the public company under the name Glen Morangy. By the way, so people say Glen Morangy, it's Glen Morangy. It's I know, I, I'm, I'm not. I mispronounce things. I'm, I'm not a one to pick up uh, pick on people about pronunciations. Yeah, Glen Fittick is another. Fernando, right? That is staying uh, stayed in the same uh, ownership. At this point, the McDonald family retired from the industry and sold the shares to Moet Hennessy. Remember that. Yeah, so the history of distillers is quite complex. I can't imagine, you know, I go much, much, much more in depth um, in my video than do these books. So I'm trying to absorb far more information than what's going to be required on the test. Um, so it's always better to know more than less. Nice. Returning in late, just let you know what I'm drinking here. This is a, a, a wee dram given to me by Dram Yankee. This is Lafroy Karchis PX cask. I'm not drinking Glen Morangy tonight. I'm drinking uh, Lafroy. Because I can. It's my channel. I can do what I want. I just wasn't in the mood. For, this is a very good whiskey. I, it's fantastic whiskey. I just wasn't in the mood for it. I wasn't in the mood for something peated. Something barbecue-y. The Glen Morangy Company has a long tradition of exploring wood influences. You know, it does seem Glen Morangy is sort of on the frontier of cherry cast experimentation. If you're not familiar with Glen Morangy, I think they typically 
do the 10 years for the original as the base. And then they do, like the Quinta Rubin is port cast. Then they'll do a couple of years in another cast. If you haven't had the Glenn Morangy Quinta Rubin, I think it's probably my favorite of the core range. Uh, the, the original is okay, um, but if you can get the Quinta Rubin, I highly recommend it. I had a bottle, but I already finished it. A former managing director, Neil Macero, commissioned a pioneering research into the subject in 1886 to 1887 when he began experimenting with wood finishing. Macero. Macero. You know what? I'm not sure. Hold on. Uh, hold on. Founder of Edinburgh Whiskey. Uh, Cad I'm checking out something. Christian Macero. So, okay, okay, okay. I'm fairly certain this. So, former managing director Neil Macero commissioned pioneering research into the subject of his uh, experimental cast, 1986 to 1987. So, Christian Macero, I don't know if you can see that or not, she is the founder of Edinburgh Whiskey Academy. And she talks, she, I had, I did an interview with her on, um, on my channel, and she mentioned growing up, I think her father worked for Glenn Morangy. Uh, so I'm pr pretty sure this is him. So I think this is referring to her father um, and to her early exposure as a child uh, to whiskey. Um, so anyway, so this is uh, Christian Macaro's uh, father. Fairly, fairly certain. We're, we're willing to put money uh, money on that. Uh, Chateau Margot wine cast finish. I would have loved the wine. Uh, so that's what you're drinking, Chateau, Chateau Margot. Um So what are you drinking? If you're, what is, what is the, are you drinking a whiskey finished in Chateau Margaux? So I've been to Chateau Margaux. Uh, of the first growth of Bordeaux, the only one I've been to, I haven't been to Chateau Latour, but I've been to all the other ones. Uh, and when I visited Chateau Margaux, it was pouring, pouring, pouring down rain. It didn't hurt the wine at all, but it wasn't much for doing photography, for taking photos, you know. Anyway, so now I'm wondering what the, uh, what the whiskey is you're drinking is done in a wine cast mask. All right, move on. This was essentially the re-racking of whiskey into X wine barrels for the final years of maturation. The first expression to apply this technique was the 1963 vintage, which was released in 1987, having been finished for 18 months in X Oloroso, uh, X Oloroso butts. It was the first malt to use the term finishing on the back label. Although the Inverness advertiser reported that casts from Glen Morangy were being sent to the Vatican, Italy, and to San Francisco, USA in 1880, it was only in the late 1970s that McDonald and Muir began to promote it as a single malt. Um, so, so, but the 1980s in general <coughs> um, is the rise of the single malts. You know, I think the first, if going from the night, the first real single malt. Was 1963 was a Glenfiddich, but it was it didn't really take off to the 1980s. So right about the time of the whiskey lock, the whiskey lake, and the glut is when uh, the single malts started to become popular. In 1980, the number of stills was doubled to to four. And in 1981, a highly successful and creative print advertising campaign was launched, emphasizing the high craft that went into making the malt and humanizing it. Don't know what it means by that. Each advertisement featured woodcuts of the men themselves, okay, from the distillery manager to the tractor driver, under the overall heading, crafted by 16 men of Tain. So the 16 men of Tain, the 16 men working at the distillery to uh, make Glen Morangy. Although Glen Morangy now employs nearly 400 people, the distillery workforce is still, they say, those 16 men. All righty. I think. All right. And here's the, here's the inside of the book. Terlogi Springs. Located on the edge of the woods behind the distillery, the Tarlogi Springs provide the processed water for production, 
It is crystal clear and cold in all seasons, the water bubbling up from the deep below the Earth's surface, gathering minerals on its way through rock formation. I don't think you're going to taste any minerals in the water, sorry. And, of course, they have nice big pictures of the stills, the still house, at 5.14 meters or 16 feet 10 inches, the stills at Glenmorangie are the tallest in the industry and produce a light style of spirit. The earliest stills in the style were probably installed during the rebuilding of the distillery in 1887 and were said to have come from a gin distillery. The whiskey's success in 1979 has led to a steady expansion of the capacity from two to four stills in 1979, doubling to eight stills in 1990 and increasing to 12 stills in 2008. Um, so there's a picture of a standing stone. It says, not far from the distillery stands Glen Morangy House, formerly the Cad Bowl House, in its walled garden, beyond which is the Pebble Beach of the Tarbat Peninsula, where it stood at Hilton of Car Car Cad Bowl, Hilton, of Cadball Stone, one of the most magnificently decorated Pictish monuments. So these standing stones, uh, you have the Picts, who were this, I want to call them a tribe or clan, that were in the northeastern corner of Scotland, and they like to paint themselves all kinds of colors, and they were known to be fierce warriors. There's whole documentaries on, on, the, on the Picts, P-I-C-T-S. Uh, check out the documentaries. Um... The original is now in the Na National Museum of Scotland, but has been replaced on site by replica. So there's a replica stone you can see there. And if you look at, so right there, that emblem right there, that is the pick, that's resembling the pick stone or the, uh, that's standing uh, there on the property, on the property. Of course, the original is now in the museum, as I just said, um, and so they have a replica sitting there in the, on the land. Carved around 800 CE or AD, 800 AD, the landward side depicts a hunting scene surrounded by extremely intricate zoomorphic border. I mean, a lot of animals. Uh, with further Pictish symbolism above and below, the lower panel of complex intertwined spirals, like a display of Catherine wheels, whatever that is, has been adopted by Glenn Morangy in their packaging. All right. So one of the things, if you're going to go travel around Scotland, visit distilleries, um, I highly recommend is there are other things to do and see. Um, the beauty of the land, obviously, but it's an opportunity to start to get into at least a little bit into the history of Scotland. When, after my first trip, because I knew nothing of Scotland. Let me take another sip. Nothing of its history. And with a tour guide that drove the bus from Edinburgh over to Isla. So I traveled on my own, driving around a car, going up to the Highlands and all that. But just for the trip of, to Isla, I went with a tour group on a bus. And we were there for like three days. And it was really, really good because he would point out things along the way. Which, you know, he'd point out historical sites that I wouldn't even recognize were there. I wouldn't even know what that was. So he was really informative and really enthusiastic about whiskey as well as the history of Scotland. So that made me really, really curious. And so when I came back from Scotland after my first trip, um, I started watching documentaries and videos on the history of Scotland. You know, it's, you're not going to spend years and years and years becoming an expert on the history of Scotland. Um, but at least, you know, kind of get your foot, your feet wet a little bit. Uh, watch some movies, some documentaries, read some articles, whatever. To get a sense of the place in the history, even if it's not directly related to whiskey, I think gives you an appreciation for the history and surroundings of the culture of the people who make the whiskey. Um, and so I, I it just and it's absolutely just fascinating. Studying wine and studying whiskey is an avenue to explore the world, uh, to go to different places, different cultures, different languages, different music different art, different architecture, different histories. It's just all, all absolutely fascinating. So, all righty. So that's it for this reading a little bit about Glenn Morangy. Some of what we just read will be on our upcoming quiz, which we're going to have in a minute. 
<laughs> Excuse me. All righty. Uh, I wish Dram Yankee was watching. I'd like to thank him for this Dram. I'm going to pour myself a little bit more. I know it seems to be strange to be drinking Lafroy while talking about Glen Marangy. But uh, we're at the half hour mark, so let's get into our quiz. Only five questions. The purpose of the, of the quiz is to reinforce uh, what we've already heard and just reading, as well as my video from earlier this week. And I, I think I'm trying to focus on some of the main standout points. I mean, every distillery, for, for the most part, closed during the First Second World War. They all had issues during the Prohibition. I mean, there's no sense of repeating that all the time. Uh, a lot of the information is, you know, the increasing of the number of the stills. Um, I, I think you should know who the founder is, and you should know who currently owns it. You know, even if it changed hands a hundred times between who founded it and who currently owns it. I don't necessarily expect any. I don't think anybody should be expected to, to memorize every all those every hand that ever touched the distillery, but I think you should know who currently owns it and who founded it. Um, and I think you should be familiar with the, the core range. Um, and so, what are some of the main standout points about that distillery? Alrighty, so that's hey Chad Ford. Thanks for turning. He says, "Is that the single barrel, nine year old Knob Creek behind you?" <laughs> That is a single barrel, 120 proof. Uh, yes, and that's actually one I got at the distillery years ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's one I actually got at the distillery. All right, but we're not going to talk about bourbon tonight. All righty, question number one. Here we go. It is said that Glen Morin distills are as tall as A, a redwood tree, B, a brontosaurus, C, a giraffe, or D, a three-story building. So what is it? Is it tall as a redwood tree? Now, if you've not seen a redwood tree, because uh, mostly native to California, uh, they're the tallest trees in the world. Some of the oldest, we have, tr we have trees here that are hundreds and hundreds of years old. Uh, if you've not seen a brontosaurus, I've not seen one, but a brontosaurus. Did I spell that? Brontosaurus. You know, I have a feeling I misspelled Brontosaurus. Brontosaurus. You know, I think I misspelled Brontosaurus. Brontos I don't know. See a giraffe or three a three story building. Um, only watched the Glen Morey vid uh, once, so I don't ex uh, expect a high mark. And most people are saying, "See a giraffe, a giraffe, a giraffe, a giraffe." And the answer is. Oops, come on. There we go. A giraffe. Yes. They're as tall as the wild giraffes that roam the highlands. This, and that's a reticulated giraffe, in case you're wondering. That was in my video. I I put I, I did a green screen of a giraffe walking around on Glen Morangy property, if you didn't catch that. Hmm. You know, it's probably a little warm today. It's like 71 degrees. 57 degrees in Half Moon Bay. 71 degrees here. Looking forward to the cooler weather. This is more, for me, this is more of a wintertime whiskey, you know. Uh, it's so dark. It's so rich. Sitting by a fire, reading a book. You know, it's just so dark and so rich. And so dense, and a little bit goes a long way in terms of the intensity of the flavor. And it's got like a there's a fudge character to it as well, and it's just got a real long, long, long finish. I can't smoke. I'm asthmatic, um, but if you're in cigars, this would probably be a perfect uh, cigar whiskey. All right, next question. Glen Morangy gets its water source from, I don't even know how to pronounce that first one, the Alt, Alt Dirge, B, Ben Rennes, C, the Robbie Dew Spring, or D, Tarlogi Spring. Where does Glen Morangy get its water from? The Alt Dirge, Ben Rennes, 
Pinamus is like a hill or mountain. Robbie Dew Spring. Uh, and Tarlogi Spring. Donner Pass. Going to buy the place in Half Moon? Yes, I'm moving to Half Moon Bay. Um, Grumpy Old Fart says the river Tarlogi. I don't think it's a river. I think it's a spring. It's like a pond. It comes up out of the ground. I don't think it's a river. All right. We got one answer from Grumpy Old Fart. What's everybody else saying? Is it Alt Dirge, Ben Rennes, the Robbie Deer Spring, or Tarlogi Spring? Or maybe people don't want to guess because they're too busy drinking. Fernando says, see, the Robbie Deer Spring. There's somebody who didn't watch my video. <laughs> and the answer is the Tarlogi Spring. <coughs> so the Robbie Dew Spring is Glen Farkless. Or is it Glen? Yeah, Glen Farkless. The Robbie Dew Spring is Glen Farkless. Um, and so it's a Tarlogi Spring. So in the video, if you want to go back and watch my video, in which I review this whiskey, they bought the 600 acres surrounding the Tarlogi Spring because housing developments were, were coming in and they're afraid of losing the water rights so they bought i think it's 600 acres around the tarlogi spring so it is the tarlogi spring and if you go back and watch my video you'll I actually show you a, a clip of the tarlogi spring all right uh isla junkie says sorry eric not paying attention because i bought the book well there you go <laughs> Uh, next one. Question three. Glen Morangy's first stills were originally A, from Ireland, B, used to make gin. <laughs> if you're not paying attention because you read the book, then why, <laughs> then why do you hear in the chat? I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, B, used to make gin. C, used at a lowland distillery. Or they were 50% shorter. Matthew Renke, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. So Glen Morangy's first stills were originally from Ireland, used to make gin, used at a lowland distillery, or D, they were 50% shorter. Judith says B. So if I gave away prizes, people would pay attention more and they would try harder. <laughs> but I think education is the prize. Education is, is the reward. Fernando says B. And the answer is B, used to make gin. So one thing they said in, 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 in the sources, uh, rather than custom make stills to what they thought they needed, they bought the, the super tall stills they used to make gin. Now, in case you don't know what gin is, gin is essentially vodka um, that has had juniper and other botanicals added to it. That's all that gin is. Um, so, but vodka is a highly rectified spirit. So if you think about it, in order to get a highly rectified spirit, and if you're not using, if you're not using a column still, right, or a continuous still, um, then you need something that's really, really tall to give you a lighter spirit, and you could do a higher rectification. So that it kind of makes sense. So they said, okay, we'll buy some secondhand stills, and we'll buy these formerly gin stills. But once they, once you make a spirit for your whiskey, and people like it, or that becomes your profile of your whiskey you don't change it they're not like okay we got money now let's go buy some shorter stills no they're stuck with it and plus you know they can kind of play on the whole hey we got the tall stills and in scotland and it's as tall as a giraffe and all that you know um most craft distilleries uh, do start out they make and sell gin yes that is true because it doesn't require aging yes that is true i don't think that's a story with glenn Morangy, though i don't think they were making gin it's just that they bought stills uh, that had previously been used to make gin. Hmm. But I could be wrong. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I like Junkie says, didn't say I read it, bought it, and I like what you had. Okay, thanks. Sorry. Um, all righty. Next question. The one challenge, it's when you write a book, and as soon as you get published, it's out of date. There's particularly, there's been so many changes in the whiskey world. Um, you know, coming up with, you know, coming up with another book on, on whiskey, unless, particularly if you're naming distilleries and dates and owners and, you know, again, the specifics, I mean, the date is to when something was found is never going to change, but who currently owns it, that could change. And so as soon as you, like the Glendronic section in Dave Broom's book is totally out of date. So that's the challenge and the danger of putting out a book is it, it quickly go out of date. All right. Uh, next. Let's see. Glen Morangy Distillery was founded in A, 1823, B, 1834, C, 1843, or D, 1863. And if you have a bottle of Glen Morangy, it probably says it right on the bottle somewhere. Eighteen twenty-three, which is the year uh, the Excise Act of eighteen twenty-three. Eighteen thirty-four, eighteen forty-three, or eighteen sixty-three. The dates are the most difficult and probably the least interesting. Um, Fernando says C, and I'm going to go quickly into the answer. The answer is eighteen forty-three. You are correct, sir. Yay! I should get like a little cheering thing, you know, so if someone gets it right, I can go. Yay! All right. Next. I think this is our final question. Only five questions. In 2004, Glenn Mor to, excuse me, a little, little that. In 2004, Glenn Morangy was sold to who for about 300 million pounds? A, Pernod Ricard. I had Pernod Ricard on there twice. What a, how did I do that? Sorry. I did it. Oops. So either A, Pernod Ricard, B, or Pernod Ricard, C, LVMH, or D, Beam Suntory. <laughs> Matthew Winky says, I'm going to go with C for memory. <laughs> Man, how did I have... It seems like every week I do some sort of stupid mistake that even though I checked it, and even though I looked at it, I, and I, even after I made them and uploaded them, I went over them and still... Not until I go live do I notice there's a mistake. Because you love Pernod Ricard. That's right. <laughs> yes, I love Pernod Ricard. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, brother. All right. Can't take this too seriously. And the answer is LVMH. Now, here's, so here's the funny thing. LV, 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 Google it. LVMH is the abbreviation, but when you look it up, it's an abbreviation for Moet Hennessy Louis Vuitton. So why isn't MHLV and not LVMH? I am the foggiest idea. But I think I've also seen it as Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy. But when I Googled LVMH, it gave me Moet Hennessy Louis Vuitton. I don't know. So they do everything from jewelry, I think perfume, of course, uh, for extra points. Okay, here's extra points. What other distillery does LVMH own? Put an answer down there. All right. What other distillery, Scottish distillery, does Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, or Moet Hennessy Louis Vuitton own? Put it there in the, in the comment section. First one to put it on, the answer, right, correct answer gets extra 10 points. I'm not giving away bottles or anything. Let's, yeah, let's, uh, yeah, uh, Fernando is correct, Ardbeg. Ding, 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 ding. That is correct. This is La Santa. Uh, no, this is, uh, La Santa is very nice. <clears throat> this is um, 
the Malaga cask. So the La Santa is their sherry cask uh, from the Quarter Range, and Quinta Rubin is uh, their port cask. Both, I think, are very, very, very nice. I used to have bottles of each, uh, but I finished them. And actually, if you blend those two, the La Santa and the Quinta Rubin, or make the Quinta Santa, or you want to call it, very, 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 very good. Uh, they used to be the 12 year old, and now it's the 14. Now they have the 14 year old. Uh, the 14 year old, so yeah. So Louis Vuitton, Mo Annecy, or Mo Annecy, Louis Vuitton also owns uh, Ardbeg, owns Ardbeg. Yes, yes, Malaga, Malaga with Pedro Jimenez and uh, Muscatel. Uh, did I win a free sample from your collection that I can pick? You know, my only problem with giving samples away has nothing to do with giving samples away. It's the it's the shipping and the mailing and the packaging. It's a pain in the ass. Um, it's if you ever it's a, I, I'm going to be moving to Half Moon Bay. If you ever in Half Moon Bay, come on over. I I have no problem giving away whiskey. I'm not a stingy person. It's just a pain in the ass to mail this stuff, um, and it costs more money to ship it uh, and all that kind of cred than anything else. So anyway. Alrighty, um, yeah, LVMH. Yeah, I think they also own a champagne house, if I recall correctly, uh, as well. Yeah, Moet Hennessy. Yeah, Moet Hennessy is a champagne house. Sorry, my brain slipped. Alrighty, so I think I'm gonna wrap it up. Um, we only went uh, about forty-seven minutes, just short of an hour. Hope everyone has an absolutely fantastic week. If you haven't already, uh, if your father's still alive, wish him a happy Father's Day. Um, so now that I've got a house, I've already started packing. I'm packing some other stuff. i got to pack all this stuff. I do not know if I will do another live stream before I move. I might. I might not. Um, I do have some of the videos. They've already been uploaded. So this week, um, a video on... I can't remember. I'm trying to remember. Um, Old Pulteney will be posted, and a video on. It's funny. I can't remember what, what whiskeys I, I did. Old Pulteney, and I am losing my mind. I don't remember. I guess you'll find out when it posts. So I got two videos currently up, posted up. I'm currently working on a video on Akintoshin. I'll try to get that recorded. So I've preloaded videos. So for the next couple of weeks, so even if I pack all this stuff up, not doing the live streams, so there'll still be more uh, content that'll be posted in the very near future. Alrighty, uh, if you watch this on the replay, if you have any comments, have any questions, leave them down below. And on the replay, I'm gonna put right here and right here. I'm gonna put clips for more videos to watch. So back to about 24 hours, there will be clips right here for more content that you can watch after watching this one. All right, I uh, hope everyone have a fantastic week. And until next time, Slanjiva. Bye.